Welcome to A State of Mind. This is Julian Royce. Thank you so much for tuning in. This will be the first episode of 2022. So I hope that everyone listening is enjoying the new year. A time of uh, reflection, <laughs> often a time of making and then failing to one degree or another various New Year's resolutions. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the effort is not worthwhile. And um, I was talking about this with someone the other day. I think it's really worth your time to define carefully what success means to you. For example, well, and this is maybe it's just a silly example, but say you eat ice cream every day or whatever it is, and you want to stop that. And so you make a New Year's resolution, I'm not going to eat any ice cream at all. And then the month of January goes by and towards, and you're doing great, not eating any ice cream. And then towards the very end of the month, you break down and eat some. Uh, and then you get to the end of the month and you're like, I was a failure. It's like, no, you're not a failure. You went from eating ice cream every day to eating it once or twice in a month. That's amazing. That's progress. That's a huge change. That's a huge shift. And in fact, it would, I think it would be healthier and more realistic anytime we're trying to change a habit to expect uh, that it's not going to be perfect. The quest for perfection is self-defeating and ends up, can end up, uh, you know, it's ego, ends up making us feel like a failure when in fact we're not. And it's, it's so easy to not see the progress that we are making in whatever area it is we are wanting to make progress. So today I'm speaking with Melinda Harbus Reilly. And she's one of the few guests, to be honest, that I've had on the podcast that I don't know personally. I don't know how many of you know this, but the majority of the guests on this podcast thus far are people that I know uh, personally in one way or another. And that's something that's been special about this podcast. And um, but I think it's also something that may be changing more and more in the future going ahead, maybe reaching out to more people, having more different kinds of guests on. And she is one of them. She is an author and she shares with us her new book called Becoming. Uh, but in, in addition to being an author, she's also a naturopath, Reiki healer, Kundalini yoga teacher, and spiritual coach. And she has two decades of experience in health and wellness in general. And she is in Australia, so um, I appreciated you know, the miracle of modern technology that we can talk to people from all over the world, and when it all goes well, it works pretty well, and it's pretty easy, and, that, and that's amazing. In her new book, Becoming, it's actually a fictional book, and it's her first book of fiction as she shares she wanted to share some of the lessons that she's learned in her own life through the fictional characters that she wrote about. One of the things we talked about that was that if you read a lot of a certain kind of book, for example, self-help books, uh, in her case, she, she shares about reading so many of them that she got tired of them. And she realized she enjoyed reading fiction and then she wanted to try to write fiction. I can relate to that in terms of religious studies and psychology books, and I think that so much can be communicated through story. And um, in fact, it's the oldest and most powerful potent way to communicate information. In fact, Jordan Peterson does a great job of talking about how we evolved to understand the world through stories, through narratives, and even very technical or kind of scientific information. We often internalize and understand it in the forms of narratives and stories. And um, it's not a bad thing. I think it's, uh, according to Jordan Peterson and others like him, it's, it's how we've evolved actually. And so a story can hold just an incredible amount of information and different levels of meaning, different ways to interpret it. And so it can be a very, uh, very rich way to, to write. And that a lot of writers talk about how when they, when they start to write, the characters take on lives of their own. And I think that was also a fascinating phenomena. <laughs> that something bigger than your self starts to come through. And another thing that this conversation had me thinking about is how we now have this like globalized wellness industry, uh, but more than that, we have, you know, we're in this age of information in which so much is being shared all the time. And we have access to so many different teachings and techniques and philosophies and modalities and how that's actually a beautiful thing. Uh, I was reading an article the other day of, about how Reiki is now being offered in more and more hospitals in America, which is, which is amazing. And Reiki, I don't know much, that much about it, but um, Melinda is a Reiki teacher. We discussed that a little bit. It's a kind of energetic healing that most people would not consider scientific. <laughs> so it's definitely not operating based on a kind of materialistic understanding of the world. Um, it's operating on with the understanding of the power of our own minds. And I think it's really 
good that more and more things like this are being known and accepted. And if you don't like it or don't want it, then you don't have to do it. But for those people who do find benefit from it, whether or we can we can put aside the question of what is ult, uh, objectively true, so to speak, and just ask the question of what's helping. And if it helps someone, then we should do it. We should offer it um, because we all need more help. We all need more support. And especially when our where our health is concerned, you know, going into a, a big hospital is scary. It can be depersonalizing. That's a big institution. And so for us to find more and more ways to provide more personalized care that is holistic, that speaks to all the different parts of ourselves. Um, and that's something that Melinda is passionate about as well. We talk about that a bit in this conversation. Without further ado, I bring you Melinda Harvest Wheeling. Today with Melinda Carbus Really, <laughs> am I saying that right? <laughs> you are. <laughs> cool. And you are coming all the way from Australia, right? Where in Australia are you? Uh, two hours north of Sydney, in a little place called Newcastle. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've never been, but I, I want to go one day to that part of the world. Yeah, it's beautiful. Lots of beaches. Nice yeah. warm days. No snow like you get though. No snow. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll trade you for a few weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what is it like there? Is it warm right now? Or? Yeah. So our summers are very hot. Um, so it is, yeah, it's quite warm. So it's very much a, a beach okay. kind of atmosphere. Yeah. Well, I'm here in the cold, snowy mountains of Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And isn't that amazing? We can just chat and you're in the snow and I'm in the sun and... Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's good to, it's good to like appreciate connect. that. Yeah, not take mm. it for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how would you introduce yourself? I know you have a lot of different things that you do to help people. Yeah, um, probably these days I would say author because I sold my wellness center uh, about five or six months ago, and I'm having a bit of a break from all my other modalities. Um, but I will go back. I will go back to my naturopathy and, and Reiki. Um, but at the moment, I'm really connecting to writing. To writing. Cool. Mm. Is, that, is that a daily thing that you do every day? Or how does, how does your, your writing flow go? Mm. I actually heard this wonderful interview and a lady was saying that she was told when she was, you know, literary school that if she didn't write every day, she wasn't an author. But she didn't feel that way. She couldn't really put pen to paper every day just because it was, you know, a methodical practice. She just had these big bursts where she would obsessively write and then she would have a break. And I really resonated with her style because that's that's kind of how I write. When I get that creative urge, I, you know, I can't look up from my screen and, it, you know, mm. a whole day can pass by. Wow. And then I have a break. Yeah, I okay. have a break from writing. Yeah. I like that. I've I've heard that too about the everyday thing, and it's nice to hear that. Um, of course, it doesn't have to go that way. Yeah, yeah. The the, the uh, her teacher said, if you don't write every day, you're not an author. And so she said, well, then I'm not an author, <laughs> <laughs> even though she's his best selling. You know, I've written some beautiful, beautiful yeah. novels, but yeah, yeah. I think that getting that kind of mindset sometimes linked maybe with music or with whatever it is, but. Mm. Yeah. When the creative juices flow, you just got to roll with it. Yeah. And then yeah. you have a new book coming out called Becoming, right? Yes. Becoming All You Were Born to Be. It's my first fiction tale, oh, really? actually. It's oh. my, yeah, my first dabble at that. And do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it was going to be another self-help book, which is what I've predominantly done before this one of just how to embrace life even with all its ups and downs and its challenges that it throws you, mm. how to, you know, not wait for everything to be peaceful around you to be happy and appreciative of life. Um, but it, the words weren't coming to me as free and easy as they did for Digging Your Dark Side. That book just wrote itself. Um, but this one I'd sit down and I would try and then nothing and then, 
you know, maybe get a couple of paragraphs out and just wasn't coming to me. And, and then myself, because I'm an avid reader and I've always read, you know, Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra, you know, all those amazing minds and their words of wisdom, I was starting to get bored um, mm. as much as I love them and I yeah. idolise them. They were all starting to sound the same to me and I thought, you know what, I don't really want to throw another book on that pile that's already so expansive and there's already so many amazing people doing the work. So I just thought, you know what, I might just throw these concepts into characters and I'll just create people and and their normal day-to-day life issues and there's some trauma in there. There's just some, you know, finding yourself and and just how those people still can see the beauty in life and how everything is intertwined and there's always a reason, there's always a purpose, there's always a destination that we're travelling towards. Yeah, so I just yeah. thought I'd throw it into some characters and see what what happened. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, mm. I can relate to that when you read a lot of, I don't know, self-help or spiritual books or maybe in my case, like, you know, Buddhist books or things about meditation, they, <laughs> you kind of like take a break after a while. And I have, yeah. I have fantasized about writing fiction where you kind of play out ideas through characters. Like, you know, mm. Dostoevsky would do that, like develop these like philosophical ideas and take them to kind of extreme places through the characters. Yeah. See where they would go. It's fun. It's yeah, really fun. Cool. Much, yeah, it is. Because you just, it, when you're writing a self-help book or a spiritual book, you've got to be really careful that everything you say, you're dotting all your I's, you're crossing your T's, you're saying the right thing. But when you're writing a fiction tale, you don't have to make sense all the time because it's fiction. So it gives you a lot more freedom. Mm, yeah. Mm. And I, Yeah, I haven't read the whole book, but I started it and it starts with a, a bang, literally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it does start with a bang. <laughs> with a car crash and all that and... I just, yeah. I liked how you, you know, kind of show the the character Lisa being so busy, you know, and so distracted, and how I mean, how typical that is, right? Mm. Like it, it's a, a lot of her there character. More car crashes every day. I mean, there's already <laughs> too many, but it's amazing there aren't like ten times as much. Yeah, agree, agree. We're all so distracted and focused on our to dos, and how can I squeeze as much into this next fifteen minutes as as possible, and um. Yeah, that treadmill is, I think we're slowly turning it around, but it used to be idolised that, you know, the more busier you were, the more important you seemed. Right. And we sort of, yeah, we made that connection where I think more people I talk to are embracing slowness and they're embracing space, which is really nice to see that transition. Yeah, that's really good. I think um, Mm. it's fascinating how, uh, you know, different cultures have different, ways of measuring wealth or status or because, you know, it wasn't that long ago when the aristocracy, the royalty, the princes and queens and kings, they would be, you know, as a sign of their wealth, they would do nothing all day, right? They didn't have to do anything. Yeah. (laughs) And so for us to be kind of proving ourselves all the time, it's an interesting thing. And uh, I guess there's maybe blessings and curses, pros and cons to both of those extremes because we have a world in which we have incredible technological progress, but then we also have all these problems that that's causing, right? So, Yeah, yeah. We've got to find that balance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you talk about um, society's expectations that achieving equals being worthy. Mm. I think, and, and I was so stuck in that mindset as well, that achieving was being worthy. And... I was running myself into the ground, you know, six years ago. I was studying full-time. I was doing my clinic hours as well in a a medical practice. Mm. And I was raising five children, um, opening up my five kitties and (laughs) opening up a a wellness centre, meaning, you know, building the structure from the ground and and then creating the business plan and the, the procedures and policies and, Um, And I was teaching classes and I was working as a naturopath and I just, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous what I was putting myself through. And then I ended up with adrenal fatigue and adrenal fatigue Mm. turned into depression. And, um, and yeah, we just really seemed to 
not value and love and appreciate ourselves as much as we do as the status of ourselves sometimes. We can get really caught up in that, um, but that makes us feel worthy. But really, you know, like the kings and queens you were just speaking of, it's okay to do nothing. (laughs) You're still worthy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, what would you say to that? I mean, that we should find a balance, you know, sometimes in life maybe we're inspired to do more and sometimes Mm -hmm. to rest. I agree, yeah. When your your energy is up and you can you feel that real drive, it's beautiful to embrace that. Like your body's giving you and serving you with energy, so roll with it. But it's just when we are not listening to it, when it's saying, okay, I, I need a break now, I need to rest. And I think we all work very differently. I'm very cyclical. So for mm. me personally, I am the type of person that will have a burst of energy, be able to really smash out lots of things. And then I need that time of rest afterwards where I know other people that maybe we'd call them plotters and they just always sort of seem to keep that same energy level and they, they might not spike and get lots of, lots of things done, but they're very consistent in their energy. Mm. And I think just knowing your, your baseline and, and, how you operate is really helpful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Like learning, mm. getting to know how you work, who you are and how you best yeah. operate. Yeah. Yeah. And just honoring that, not trying to be like everyone else, just this is how I roll. These are my strengths. Yeah. Well, you mentioned medical mm. hours. What, what was that for? Uh, so I was working with an integrative doctor. So he was uh an amazing man. He was a doctor, but he was also a herbalist and he would um, hire naturopaths like myself to be support workers. So we would do half his, he always wanted to serve instead of, you know, the throw them in for seven and a half minutes and get them out the door concept Mm. that most doctors roll with. He gave his clients an hour. So they would spend about 40 minutes with us as the naturopaths. We would take all the notes, you know, make a baseline, make a bit of a, um, a summary of what was going on for them and then they would spend the last 20 minutes with the doctor who would pull all that information from, you know, our left mm-hmm. side of naturopathy, natural wellness, and and then help them medically. Cool, beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's exciting to hear about it. I feel like it's it's becoming more common to have what are often called alternate healing modalities. Mm. Um and I think that's good and necessary to balance out our kind of Western medical tradition. But yeah. I mean, I look forward to a day when, when it's all more integrated and there isn't like all these different, uh, you know, alternate this or that, you know, there's so many different types of healing modalities, which is beautiful. But I wonder if we will start to really bring things together and integrate them. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's the way things seem to be going and more and more people I know in in my industry are learning a lot of different modalities. They're not just sticking to one thing, which helps to expand your mind and and treat your patients more holistically or your clients more holistically. Yeah. Mm. That's what we need. (laughs) Yeah, we do. Well, so what... I guess, well, before we move too far away from your new book, what inspired the story exactly? Uh, The story, well, Lisa, the characters were the inspiration, if that makes sense. So I wanted all these, I had these lessons that I wanted to share that that I had learned myself throughout my life. And so I just grabbed those lessons and pulled them apart and, I uh, created Lisa and she was kind of based on that person that I spoke of that I was about six years ago, just running myself to the ground, not appreciating myself, mm. not looking after myself, always thinking outward of, you know, how can I serve others? But I was trying to do that from an empty tank. So the character of Lisa I sort of drew that element of myself and created a whole character um, and her, the way she expanded and learnt that she was so valuable without those things and she had issues with her body mm. image and and just how she overcame that and realised that she was beautiful and how that was rubbing off on her daughter and her daughter 
evolving past that mindset of, you know, of to be ashamed of what you look like and always try and aspire to, to be more like someone else. So I really tried to bundle those normal struggles that women go through and I think men as well sometimes too go through and then I wanted another character um, that was a bit more superficial and she was all about status and having the best car and mm. living in the best area and and have her career and always wanting ma- a man for money and what mm. he could bring to her life instead of a genuine connection. Um, I wanted to really explore that kind of woman and how she could transform herself into, you know, a more humble, caring, giving human being. Mm. And then the third main character was Larissa, who I also drew a lot from myself and she struggles mentally. Her biggest gift is her mind. She has this ability to tap into uh, this intuitive knowledge, the expanded mind, the universal mind. But she also struggled with her mind taking over and and suffering with depression and anxiety. And she was always trying to find that balance between how her strength was also her weakness and and trying to and find that that sweet spot where she could really work with that. So, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, the basis of the book was just to think about all the struggles that we all go through and, you know, there's a lot of trauma and drama in there and I threw that in because I think sometimes we all wait for life to be better or easier before we want to be happy, like, okay, I'll be, I'll be better once I've got through this, you know, drama or I'll be better when the kids leave school or I'll be better... And we're always looking right. forward instead of just going, you know what, I know that everything is falling apart around me, but there's still beauty in this pain. There's mm-hmm. still something that is coming out of this for me or for the people around me, for all of us, that is bringing us back together into for me, it's a puzzle. It's like we're, we were one consciousness, we were one big image, mm. and then we were just dissected into these little puzzle pieces and pulled apart, and we're all having their, our own experience so we can come back to that picture mm. once again. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to share that philosophy and that belief that I yeah, have with other people. Yeah. Mm. yeah that reminds me of... Um you know, yoga and Indian spiritual teachings of like, we're all God or we all have God consciousness or we're all, we're all one. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a good good perspective. Even if you like can let go of analyzing it or thinking about what's literally, whatever that would mean true or not, but like to see other people actually practice seeing other people as a different reflection, you know, but that ultimately we're Mm. the same being it's, it's, it's can be cool to try that out in your life (laughs) yeah absolutely and just seeing yourself in other people and having compassion that they're going through their own struggles too there's it's yeah it's it's all around (laughs) us it's i listened to a teacher the other day and he said we're all just you know beings trying to get our needs met that's all we're doing and we're just going Mm. about life going through life trying to get our needs met and sometimes that looks like someone getting road rage and yelling, you know, F you and getting red in the face. But like underneath that, he has, there's some need there that he's trying to get met. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not a very good way to get him that, but it, you know, it's a cool way to think about things. <laughs> yeah. It just allows you to have more compassion that, yeah. you know, we said we're very quick to label, aren't we? Like you're, you know, Wally or you're not a nice person because you did this, but really that's not the case. We've all been, Wallies in our life, haven't we? I don't know if you used that word in America, but we've all say that word again. (laughs) A Wally. (laughs) Wally, that's a new word for me. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if it was something. (laughs) Yes, you know, someone that just a pork chop, someone that just carries on. And but we've all. I mean, I can reflect (laughs) back over my life and think about so many times where I haven't been my most dignified self. So why would I expect anyone else to, you know, have their stuff together all of the time? And yeah. not go through those moments of outbursts or frustration and sadness coming through and, and acting out. It's yeah, it's um absolutely. 
yeah, it'd be a bit unfair to feel that way. Well, and you're, and this theme of um, that we don't need to be busy or be doing a lot in order to be worthy, for you, was having children a part of that discovery? Um, or did that become like another thing that you were <laughs> achieving or doing? I think it did, to be honest. It was, um, for me, I lost my first child when he was seven months old. Oh. So for me, having him and then losing him and then he being my first child, being my only child at the time, that motherhood was just taken from me, but I still felt like a mother. Mm. And so when I had my next two boys, they just became my world. I appreciated them on a whole other level because I had two healthy boys. Um, and I think they helped me in those early days to – not feel busy all the time and just embrace the beauty of being a mother and looking after someone and caring for them more than you do yourself. But as they got older, I think I did get stuck in the, the busy. Um, I think a lot of mums do this. You think your kid has to do everything, you know, the guitar lessons, the drum mm. lessons, the swimming lessons, yeah. footy on the weekend. And you, it's almost like it becomes another career that you're trying to, and I think you've got to stop and just look at it and go, you know what, just let them run in the backyard. They don't have mm. to do all these lessons and be the best at this and have all these different experiences under their belt. They just need an imagination and, and time to play. So I did go through a period where they added to my busyness through my own doing uh, and I had to bring myself back and go, no, this is, yeah, this is not, this is not what raising a yeah. child is about. That's not the kind of human beings yeah. I want to create where they feel like they have to be great at everything and busy all the time. I want them to have space. Yeah. I, I used to work as a tutor and I saw that with the kids, you know, and I, mm. I was, one of the other things that they were, you know, shuffled all these appointments or meetings or practices. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, it's, it's something. It's, one of the things about it is it's, you know, everything then is running on this like schedule and clock time. And I mean, that's how yeah. it's organized, but I think having unstructured time is so valuable. And, oh, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing for them. And just to see them, what they, you know, through COVID, uh, everyone being locked down. My 15-year-old was going down the beach every day. We live just with the beach at the back. So he was walking out the back gate and he started building uh, a hut down there. Yeah. And he, he built this amazing hut and it's incredible. Like he was showing, I'm not allowed to go there. It's his secret place. Yeah. So <laughs> I only got to see videos of it, but it was incredible what he built. And I just think, you know, that's because he had all this time and space. He wasn't in this structured world and his creative mind just really came and flourished and and look what he achieved. It's incredible. Yeah. No, that's a great example. I love that story. It's almost like mm. we are driven at times, at least by this fear that if we didn't have all this structure and busyness, then we would sit around and do nothing or just watch Netflix or just get high or drink. Or I don't think, <laughs> yeah. that's, I don't think that's how human beings really are in nature. I think we do those things to compensate for all the stuff we do that we don't actually want yeah. to be doing, right? Isn't that? Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah. To switch off for a little while. But if you're already switched off and just enjoying the moment, you're not going to need that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some people uh, make fun of it or whatever, but I've, I'm someone who's been to Burning Man a few times, and that is such an example of such uh, amazing creativity and I've never seen people work so hard, but there's no money exchange. You know, I mean, people are, are spending money to be there, but they're not doing things for money. And it's just they're doing it because it's fun or it's inspiring or it's creative or there, there's community. Or, But um, just, I mean, the whole city is built in a week, right? So it's just like this this incredible gathering. And it's not, it's not operating out of, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but it has a completely different kind of vibe to it. You know, it's not coming from this kind of, busy world in the same that way. is like, yeah uh, i mean or that you've been three times did you say uh it's yeah three times. it's yeah. a 
It's on my bucket list. It is on my yeah. bucket list. One time, one time I got to go and I got there a few days early and helped build. So I, I, I saw like this totally flat space and it's, it's bizarre because it's so flat. It's like, it doesn't feel natural or normal. You know, it's like kind of like you're just like in a video game or something where before anything happens or I don't know. And then just watch things <laughs> well, kind of rise up out of it. <laughs> So, that would be amazing. Such yeah, an experience. Yeah, if you get to go a few days early, it's definitely worth it. But it's not easy. Yeah. It's, it's a tough environment to be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. But well worth it when you see the end result, right? Yeah. Well, so for you, the the shift out of this busyness came partly just from the fatigue and from, did you have a time where you kind of just shut down from it all? I, I It was a real slow there were so many times I could have tapped out and listened to my body, but I didn't. And I just noticed, you know, I was always very active and energetic and healthy and I would bounce out of bed to go for a run before I'd work. And then I'd notice I didn't want to get out of bed to go for my run. Mm. And then I didn't even want to get out of bed to go to work. I mm. just noticed this feeling of apathy and and disconnection from my normal passion that I was feeling for my life. Um, so it just was very slow and there was so many gentle nudges that the universe was giving me of you need to slow down, you need to slow down um, and I just kept pushing and pushing um, myself to to keep going. I just thought I had to keep going, just you can do it, just get this done, get that task done. I felt like I had the world on my shoulders and I didn't want to not give to my children um, just because I was opening this new business and finishing off my study. So I was the one that was missing out. I wasn't sleeping mm. um, so I could fit in everything that I needed to for the day. But I, I had plenty of warning signs, um, just some lack of energy and then the adrenal fatigue kicked in and then I was starting to have gut issues and, mm. and then I started drinking, which wasn't a normal mm. thing for me mm. on a daily basis just to bring myself down a Mm. couple of pegs yeah it really was this Mm. little spiral that slowly took me down I know I know a lot of people listening will will be able to relate to that in some version of it you know Mm. you you hit some kind of wall and you yeah Mm. or you have a car accident or (laughs) break your leg there are ways I think in which um it's not just random or accidental it's actually our deeper intelligence of our body that's saying hey let's take a break let's slow down Absolutely. It is. You know, you hear it all the time. People, as soon as they stop, that's when they get sick. Right. Their body is, yeah, it's just been trying to keep up with you for so long. <laughs> and then you finally give it space and it's like, oh, I need to get this junk out. I need to get it out. Yeah. You have not treated me well. <laughs> <laughs> and you, um, yeah. do you call yourself a spiritual coach in part? Is that part of what you what you do? Yeah, I probably, yeah, I usually say wellness coach, but wellness. spiritual coach is, yeah, definitely a label that I would use. I, like I said, I'm having a bit of a break. I'm having lots mm. of space at the moment, which feels amazing. But I'll go back to doing that this year. I will mm. jump back in. It is my favourite thing to do. Oh, really? Do you, would, you, mm. would you call yourself spiritual but not religious or some version of that? Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm religious. For me, it's very personal. It's very inward. And I don't have a particular methodology or uh, belief structure that I I tap into. It's more just, you know, through meditation, through prayer, through finding the ways that I connect best to that universal mind, that mm. intelligence that that we all have the ability to tap into, but I think we just tap into it in such diverse different ways. Mm. So it's such a personal experience to have. Yeah, that's a good description. I appreciate that. I think, like, I mean, more and more people are are, are resonating with that, or you know, describing themselves in that way, or finding some spiritual, for lack of a better word, dimension of life, some transpersonal, some bigger than themselves experience and then Mm. integrating it, but not necessarily wanting to belong to a particular group or church or, you know, 
follow a particular mm. teacher. I mean, that just, I, I'm a religious, I have a master's in religious studies, so I kind of studied this some in school, and it's just, wow. I, feel, I don't think that, some people, you know, maybe criticize some of this stuff, but I think, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's, um, you know, we're not, we're in a, I don't know, we're, we're in an age where people aren't wanting to belong to organize things as much, like maybe, but we, we want community, we want connection, but I don't know. I'm wondering if like the age of the so-called guru, it's kind of ending and we're in a different kind of age mm. of humanity. <laughs> I think I noticed this with, um, I don't know if you know much about Kundalini yoga, but that's the, the style of yoga that I taught, I was taught. So that's what I'm a teacher for, Kundalini yoga. And the guru for that was Yogi Bhajan. Right. And he talked, it was, it's really interesting, but he's, a, he's passed away now. But while he was in America and, and thriving with his Kundalini teachings and had this huge following, he talked about how we were moving into the age of Aquarius and the age of Aquarius actually hit after he passed away and how that everything, the structure that we're used to where it's top down would flip itself and it would be bottom down. So humanity and community will actually rule, not this hierarchy system of corporations and religious leaders. And, and what was really interesting is that he said all this would happen and, and even his reign over Kundalini Yoga crashed about three years ago they found out that he was you know abusing some people in mm. his following um sexually wow. uh, yeah so it was after he passed away and he didn't have an opportunity to defend himself um but okay. even his you know I just that blew my mind the irony of that that he was saying that <laughs> no one would follow a guru anymore and, and he himself has really crashed in the kundalini community and we're finding more community as opposed to having a leader. Um, oh yeah, that's as, fascinating. Yeah, I don't know a, a lot about um, the scandal with him, but it so it happened after he died. It did. So, yes. yeah, it's. I think that's always harder because you know the man's gone. Right. And right. yeah, so it's, it's fascinating. I've, I've there. There's some of these scandals there's so many now right but there, there's some that where it seems mm. fairly clear cut but then there's so many where there's so much gray area and i've actually like spent time you know investigating researching talking to people especially about shambhala buddhism i had some podcast episodes about it and i guess i kind of came to a place of like you know, it's not my job to figure out what happened and what the truth is and who's the blame and where things went wrong and but maybe it's yeah. simpler to just say we're moving into an age where we can have new structures we don't need the we don't, everything doesn't need to depend on this one person who, if they do something wrong, then everything is called into question or worthless like that. I, I, I reject that. That's too extreme. You know, Kundalini yoga has helped a lot of people. It's a, it's, it's beautiful practices there. Shambhala Buddhism it has is. helped a lot of people. There's beautiful practices there. So it doesn't mean throw it all out mm -hmm. or it's all garbage or something, but so. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a beautiful example of we're all human. So all human, even though yeah. these people, yeah, these people that created these amazing practices for us to follow. And like you said, we all benefit from this still at the end of the end of the day, they still have an ego. They still have desires. They still have that, that human essence to them. So of yeah. course they're going to stuff up. And when they stuff up, it's going to be on a grander scale because they have more opportunity to stuff up. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's interesting, uh, I've talked about this some on the podcast before, but there's fascinating neuroscience that's actually shown that as a human being is given more power, they're put in you know positions of power in an organization, they, they lose empathy. And you can see it in like brain yeah. scans that happen. <laughs> so wow. It's like that old saying, power corrupts. I mean, there's something that happens, you know, and I think people that have been in power for a long time, I, I think they get kind of worse and worse in that way somehow. And it's a shame, yeah. but um, it seems to happen. It's fascinating. And that's why I think this whole age of Aquarius ideal is, you know, that the communities, they run themselves. It, it just takes that pressure away from one person yeah, um, or a, gr a group of people. Right. I, yeah, mm. I guess while we're on the subject, like you could still be a teacher, a leader in the community, but there should be accountability. And mm. If something, you know, there should be some kind of, thing where like if they make mistakes or hurt someone there's accountability and it doesn't destroy the whole you know thing 
or whatever. Cause, yeah. Um, I've talked to some people who have, you know, they've been heavily involved in a particular group and then a scandal happens and then they feel like they wasted years of their life. And uh, hopefully they can kind of work through that because I don't think that's actually true, but I, I sympathize with mm. it. You know, it's, it's, it's sad. It's not. Yeah. I want to wish that on It anyone. is sad. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I had a lot of my fellow teachers who pulled the pin, wanted nothing to do with Kundalini Yoga after right. all this transpired, yeah. which is sad because we – all bonded over it. I was there while we had these major breakthroughs and shared these experiences with people and to, to think that they didn't, they were no longer going to value that. Hmm. That was quite sad for me. Yeah. Cause we, we did transform together. So that, that's been a big part of your life. Did you meet uh, Yogi Bhajan? No, he passed away long before my, my oh, okay. time in Kundalini yoga. Yeah, so I never met him, um, but through the training we had to watch a lot of videos of him. Um, very hard to understand, <laughs> <laughs> but very thick Indian accent. Um, he was quite a humorous fellow. Uh, he wasn't very humble, <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> very, you know, egocentric about how, yeah. you know, grand he was, oh. but... Yeah, that's, I mean, that's was, life, uh, that's humans. <laughs> he was a Sikh, right? Was it from mm. Sikhism? Yes, he was. Uh, and he merged that with the yoga. Uh, but the, the Sikhs in India disowned him. So yeah. when he came to America and he started to integrate Sikhism with the yoga, they didn't like what he was packaging up. So he was sort of cut from the yeah. Sikhs. Mm. that's another thing that's happened so much when these ancient lineages meet our modern world there's often it's hard to be to fully follow the traditional ways in this modern context so it's kind of you know <laughs> kind of got kind of to go one way or yeah. the other i feel like yeah well yeah I, mean, the- I know this is a big subject and we don't have to get too into it but do you want to share a little bit like in terms of what you learned of kundalini yoga and the energetic body as part of the idea that you're activating this kundalini energy and awakening it, and that would lead to yeah. Kind of awakening. Yeah. So the kundalini is the energy that resides at the base of your spine. And in modern science terms, and this is what I love about yoga is that it's really based on mysticism, but now we have science that actually backs it up and it just uses different terminology. So the kundalini is a, an energy that resides at the base of your spine and, and in scientific terms you would you would call it your spinal fluid and it sits at the base of your spine and you have that energy that you can tap into and pull up. So we usually just have this reserve or this reservoir Uh, that we don't tap into and kundalini yoga is all about drawing that energy up allowing it to travel up the spine and we want it to come up the brain stem and into the pineal gland the Mm -hmm. pineal gland is where we get our melatonin from and it helps with those mystical experiences when people have those out-of-body experiences where they can see you know universal energy and have Um, I guess like a psychedelic type of experience without actually taking psychedelics. Um, Yeah, so that's the whole premise of the kundalini energy is drawing it up and learning how to tap into it and placing it at the pineal gland so you can see the world from a different perspective. And what I, I found really interesting, Eckhart Tolle talked about how plenty of people that would come to his talks and I know I've gone a little bit off kundalini yoga but he we all know that he's a very spiritual tapped in man and so these people would come and talk about drugs and he'd never experienced it so he took LSD to see what everyone was talking about (laughs) yeah it's pretty cool he talks about it with Russell Brand and he had this he went on he had an LSD and he said it felt no different to how he normally felt because it was this, that was his perception of the world. It was this um, like 5D experience all the time. And so having the LSD did nothing. Uh, and I found oh, that really fascinating. Yeah. I have to listen to that. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Look it up. It's I, a I'm great a interview. Eckhart, I'm a fan of Eckhart Tolle. I think he's a very awake being and he's really changed mm. our world. So that's interesting. He has. Yeah. There's a few of those 
huge leaders. And I think Joe Dispenza is, Dr. Joe Dispenza is another one. And he does help explain the science. He talks about Kundalini Yoga in his Becoming Supernatural book. Um, He talks about, yeah, Kundalini Yoga, which was really exciting for me. So, but Kundalini Yoga isn't just about the the energy at the base of your spine and having that mystical experience. It's it's also about the the way they integrate. It's very scientific the way it's integrated with. We use mantra, so your voice. We use that to massage the vagus nerve, so the vibration of using voice um, against the brainstem and and the vagus nerve to help nourish all your digestive system, your heart, your lungs. Uh, so many places in your body and and using that along with mudra so you're connecting in with the Mm. nerve endings basically the meridian points at the tips of your fingers so you're connecting in with that energy and then you've got the postures and the breath that tap into different parts and so it's this really holistic experience of having um, your nervous system and your glandular system Mm. all being stimulated and and healed while you do your kundalini practice. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful description Mm. of it. Mm, It's really, for me, it's very special. I don't feel like you can ever do kundalini yoga and not feel different when you get up. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's powerful. I've only really done it two or three times in a class, but um, partly because I'm been practicing with Tibetan Buddhism for a long time. And so if they have similar yogas, mm-hmm. but they're considered more secret and esoteric. And I think uh, Taoism, you know, from China has similar. Yeah. Uh, of course, the yoga, other yoga traditions from India, but there's, the, you know, these traditions of these like energetic, subtle bodies. And I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of differences, but there's also a lot of similarities. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, they're all beautiful practices. They just sort of tapped into it in a different way, haven't right. they? I like, yeah. I like what you said about integrating, like that you you start to awaken these energies and you want to integrate them in your in your life, like your voice, you know, your your body, your mm. interpersonal relationships, hopefully. <laughs> yes, yeah, and let it expand out, not just keeping your yoga to your mat. I think right. a lot of us can do that. We can get on our mat and we can have this experience and we get in our car and we start screaming at someone. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just making sure you're taking a bit of your mat out into your life with you. Right. Yeah, for some reason, that's like the most challenging, but maybe also the most important part of it. Uh, absolutely. I'll never forget, I went to this beautiful yoga class. It was about seven or eight years ago, and I went to this amazing class. I had the best meditation that I'd had in a class setting, and then I got home, and I had an argument with my sister over the phone. And I was in the wrong. I was definitely in the wrong. I had to apologize. <laughs> but I, I, I reflected back over that. I'm like, what happened? How did I just have this incredible yeah. experience? Feel so high. And then I got on the phone and my energy got dense and I got ratty. And, and it was a really nice moment of reflection of you didn't, you didn't keep. It was it's my responsibility to keep that energy mm. going. And I didn't do that. And it was a nice lesson. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. It's humbling, but it's also like we said we're human and have self-acceptance. Mm. And, yeah. And um I guess the tricky part for me is like you know, sometimes anger, irritation is is needed in some way, you know, hopefully in a but it can come out in a in a good way, you know, a more conscious way, but it's yeah. not, it's not the answer to just try to shut all that down or not let yourself ever feel that, right? But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anger equals action. It, right. it moves us into action. So it's a powerful emotion when you use it wisely. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And you've also done Reiki healing? Yes. Reiki, yeah. So I do these workshops where I integrate Reiki and Kundalini together. So we do a nice Kundalini um practice and then everyone lays down and I do Reiki on the room for everyone and it's such an amazing experience but yeah Reiki um it's very similar to yoga and the energetic bodies working with the chakras so there's a lot of similarities there mm. with the healing method but it's incredible I've I've seen people um that are just so open that lay down for their Reiki healing and I've I've seen the physical response like a lady had dermatitis all over her feet they were nasty 
um, giving her so much grief and she got off the table and there was nothing there. It was gone. That was after one healing session. Wow, and amazing. Yeah, I've seen so much transformation yeah. through Reiki when people are open, receptive and ready for it. Yeah. It's quite powerful. It's a, I want to explore, mm. experience that more, but it, it's popped up in my life a number of times in the last few weeks. And there, there was some article, a national news article about Reiki being brought into hospitals across the United States more wow. often. Wow. And um, well, that's amazing. Yeah, they interviewed these doctors and like, well, we don't know if, you know, we're not going to say whether it's quote unquote real or not, but people like it. So we're providing it for them. And I love that. You know, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. It is. It's the, the medical world is really starting to become quite open. It's so nice to see. Yeah. It's amazing. But, yeah. 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 I think we're witnessing a real yeah. transformation with the medical world, like away from this kind of strict materialism to more human centered. I hope, I, I mean, I think I'm seeing it, but I hope it happens more and more. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I spent some time just recently in hospital and, and they had mindfulness classes at the end uh, of the day. And yeah, I was like, Whoa, this is, <laughs> this is like so cool. I think mindfulness yeah. has really uh, been such a powerful movement. And I think it's that maybe opened this door for things like Reiki and other kinds of things. Yeah. I think it's the, the safer, you know, the people who really love Western and science, it's like that safer gap that little transition step where they can start to move into more (laughs) spiritual practices. Yeah. Mm. It's it's amazing in the history of psychology, the the behavioralist and the, you know, a hundred years ago were like the dominant people in psychology and they didn't believe in mind. They thought that was just like Mm. an illusion or just an epiphenomena of the brain. You know, everything was just material and it's just incredible that, (laughs) You know, people could live their whole life like based around that kind of idea, and it actually yeah. caused a, it's caused a tremendous amount of damage. You know, because they were teaching parents things like when your child cries, just leave it alone and it'll stop crying. You know, the, they were mm. teaching things like that to, to parents. It, it's terrible. Mm. Yeah, I used to go into hospitals and clinics, and they taught you to leave your child alone. It's it's incredible that mm. the child would then experience just, well, what's the point on crying? No one's right. going to meet my needs. Right. That's so sad. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> yeah, it's so sad. But, you know, we're learning. We're learning. Yeah. We're growing. Uh, well, it's been great talking to you. Do you have any other things you want to share with us? Um, I think we've really had a beautiful conversation. I've enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah. I like getting into more depth with things like Kundalini yoga and sharing that with people because I think more and more people are becoming more sophisticated in those kinds of things, you know, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a lot more trust because, you know, a lot of people like proof and that's, that's the era we've come from. And we've got these amazing people like Dr. Joe Dispenza who are bridging that gap for people. So they feel more open to, practicing things because they understand it first um i think that's a powerful thing understanding okay this is why i'm doing things and whenever i teach a class i've I've actually had a few people say to me i've never wanted to chant before but because you like i felt awkward it felt weird Mm. um but because you started the class by telling me this you know what the chanting is doing and how Mm. it's vibrating and the science of it and what it's actually doing inside my body I felt open to it and I got so much out of it and I think that we've got to meet people where where they are as Mm. practitioners and and that's where a lot of people are they they want to understand things first they want to see the proof of things first and and then they can have a level of trust and there's some of us that can just have faith and we'd have a knowing but not everyone feels that so being able to embrace that and share where these practices and philosophies come from can be a really important thing for helping people bridge that gap and move yeah. into a more spiritual being. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's well said. I, I agree. I think to go back to mindfulness, like if you are skeptical or not a quote unquote believer or don't have faith in something, to have the attitude of like, let me try something for a little bit. It's not going to hurt me and see how I feel, pay attention to my own experience. Mm. And if it helps me, great. And if not, that's fine too. Like it doesn't really matter. You can figure out what works for you. 
but yeah, but to be a little more open minded about it, you know, because it's <laughs> it's not going to like hurt you to try chanting or to try even something like Reiki no. or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. You if at worst you just fall asleep on a table if you don't yeah. if you're not getting anything out of your Reiki. At worst, you just had a little nap. So <laughs> that's like good quality rest is what ninety percent of us need more of. So would, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well it's been great having you on the podcast thanks for thanks for being on yeah it was a pleasure thank you so much for having me and i'll i'll link um your website and stuff below but do you have any um i guess you're taking a little break from from teaching do you have anything you wanted to mention in that regard yeah so i'll i'll come back i'll come back to teaching probably this first half of the year I definitely will do some work in that space I need to serve but at the moment I'm taking a lot of rest and time for myself Um, but my book is probably my biggest passion at the moment just sharing the story of life with people and how to still see the grass is green the skies are beautiful blue even when your inner world feels a little grey beautiful thanks Julian Thank you so much for listening. If you found value in this podcast, there are many ways you can support it. And one of the easiest and best is to just share it with friends, family, and post about it on your own social media accounts. That really helps the podcast a lot. You can leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts and now on Spotify Podcasts. And of course, you can join our Patreon community, patreon.com backslash a state of mind, where you will receive access to guided meditations from me, additional music and artwork, other goodies that are in the works. So check that out and learn more about my work as a therapist and meditation teacher at estateofmindcounseling.org. Thank you so much, and I will see you here next time.